our communion? Yeah, she's going to go with down. Her phone. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, welcome as we're all gathering together here outside, uh, enjoying God's beautiful creation. We do welcome you, and I'll give you, I'll give you about two minutes. Uh, there is an option uh, inside the fellowship hall with the TV going, but uh, you know, no shame there if you get up and go. That's okay. Uh, but that is an option. It is a little warmer in there. But hey, this is nice. This is beautiful. This is great. Thank you for joining us here. And uh, let's just go ahead and get ready to worship our God here this morning as everybody comes in. Yes, yeah, 10. We'll get. I'm ring it. Perfect amount of just <laughs> not overdoing it. All right, those able, let's please stand. We are here to worship our God and King this morning. You'll find in your bulletin portions of Psalm 99. I'll read the regular print, and together, corporately, we will recite the bold. It is uh, wonderful, beautiful being out here this morning. This is our God calling us to worship Him this morning. Here's Psalm 99. The Lord is great in Zion, and He is exalted above all the peoples. Let them praise your great and awesome name. Holy is he. The strength of the king loves justice. You have established equity. You have executed justice and righteousness in Jacob. Exalt the Lord our God and worship at his footstool. Holy is he. Together now, let's join our hearts as we pray to God our prayer of invocation. Father, we can't help but worship you as we look out and we see your grand, glorious creation, the uh, beginnings of spring. Lord, as we see your beautiful creation, you have called us here this morning to worship you here in this hour. What a great grace. What a great pleasure. And we do thank you for that. We ask, God, that you take away distraction as so common among us. Lord, we're so tempted to go back to the previous week. We're so tempted to think about what's ahead. But Lord, we pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would so enable us to worship you in truth and in spirit right here, right now, in this hour. Lord, may we not forget the great covenantal love you have for us, your people. May we also not forget the words you taught your disciples to pray when you taught them, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, let us now worship God in song. We will sing Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise, found there in your bulletin.
Amen and amen. As we remain standing, let us now boldly confess as the church of Christ these certain truths we hold in unison. We'll start with the Apostles' Creed there found on the second page of your bulletin. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our prayer of confession, you'll find there in your bulletin. We'll say that together and notice a few things about that. It says there, Grant me to know the way of transgressors is hard. Part of the grace of God is allowing us to see the sinfulness of sin, to see how it, it, it does not pay the dividends we think it does in the long run and that is part of it but notice too the verse of pardon found there in psalm 130 lord if you should mark iniquities who could stand there's no one here who could honestly point to another and say what you're not perfect uh, we all have these things but yet there is forgiveness in you and you may be feared i will wait for the lord my soul does wait for, for with the Lord is loving kindness, and, he, and in Him abundant redemption. So let us now go to this God together in our prayer of confession. Eternal Father, grant me to know the, the way of transgressors is hard, that evil paths are wretched paths, that to depart from You is to lose all good. All my sins I mourn, lament, and for them cry pardon. Work in me more profound and abiding repentance. Give me the fullness of a godly grief that trembles and fears, yet ever trusts and loves, which is ever powerful and ever confident. Through the tears of repentance, may your cross become all the more clear. In Jesus' name, amen. And so, Father, we do come to you confessing our sins. Lord, it is a grace when you show us that the dividends of sin are not good. The wages of sin is death. And when we understand that here in an earthly sense, that all points to your goodness and grace, actually. And Lord, as we, we uh, just prayed, through tears of repentance, may your cross become all the more clear. We ask your forgiveness for all the times this week where we uh, were short with neighbor, family, and friends, where we reacted out of our flesh, and not out of our renewed spirit made alive in Christ Jesus. For those times where we have sought in creation identity, worth, purpose, and value, which only you provide through the person work of Christ. Lord, forgive us for how that gets worked out in an ordinate anger towards those who aren't like us, in other ways in which we uh, do not see the image of God in them. Rather, we see them as an object. So we ask your forgiveness. And we don't stay here, Lord, for too long because we know that we don't stand in our own righteousness. We stand in the righteousness of Jesus Christ for His perfect life, His perfect death and resurrection for us on the cross. For we stand not condemned. Uh, we stand accepted and justified in your sight only because of Christ. And for that, we thank you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Now, it's a little different this time around. Uh, Instead of being inside, but boy, what wonderful, uh, what a wonderful, beautiful time it is out here. If you have any sort of prayer requests, please raise your hand. We'd be glad to call on you. Oh, Miss Mary Agnes. Um, I have an updated report on Adair McCoy. Okay. Oh, really? Okay, we will do that.
certainly. Yes, Mr. Julie. Certainly. Anyone else? Yes. Thank you for that, Scott. And we praise the Lord for your new job. Absolutely. All right, anything else before we go to the Lord in prayer? Well, let us go before our great God. Father, we thank you, God. Thank you for this beautiful weather. We thank you, Lord, that we can come to you. We can come to you with our prayers. We can intercede for others on behalf of them. Uh, Lord, we thank you and we praise you for such, uh, for such a ministry of prayer. And as we just heard, Lord, we do pray for those that were just brought up, for George Alexander and his battle with COVID. Uh, Lord, we pray that you would bless the doctors, give them wisdom as the best treatment for George and his immune system. Lord, that it would strengthen for this, uh, for this virus. And God, that we'd have him healed very soon, completely. We pray for our brother Adair, um, Adair Sr., we pray, God, that you would continue to, uh, Lord, that he would just be, be far better in the near future, uh, particularly this pneumonia. We pray that it would just leave his body. Uh, God, that we would see him here at worship very soon. And Lord, bless, bless his body, bless his immune system as he fights this off as well. Lord, for Scott and what he just brought to us, his dad's boat, that it would be back up and running. For this friend who just passed away, uh, for his family as they grieve uh, this Eric and, his, and, and their loss. And Lord, we praise you that Scott has found a job, that you've provided employment for him. So Lord, we, we pray right now for Ann. Uh, we pray that you continue to heal for Dink, for strength and healing for him, for our brother, brother Freddie. God, that there'd be a, a day very soon we'd see Freddie and his smiling face back here, and we pray that you continue to strengthen his body in the fight against cancer. For Mr. Mike, as he is on the last chapter, it seems, uh, as he is being treated with pancreatic cancer. Lord, we pray, more importantly, Lord, that you would heal his soul. That you would enable him to see his need for a Savior, and that Savior, Christ Jesus. For John LaRoche and his healing of cancer. For Jill Rush, uh, Provost, and the matching kidney. For David and the matching heart. For Scott, as we've just prayed. For Eric Jones, uh, for Margarita Hart's mom and the healing from her stroke. Well, Lord, for Eric, and as he's hospitalized with cirrhosis of the liver, Lord, we just prayed for his family. We pray, God, that they would uh, grieve, but yet grieve with one with hope, hope in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, for us, our nation right now, as we see all the chaos around us, God, we pray that our trust would not be in, in people, It'd be in the Savior. It'd be in Christ. Lord, I pray for revival. I pray for repentance for all of us here on this land. Lord, may we see the times rightly and understand that we need to turn to you with fervor, with energy. May we seek your face in all things. And God, as we're about to get into your word, I pray, Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we would be so under conviction, but at the same time encouraged, encouraged in the one who is our Savior, Jesus Christ that we be nourished from the meal that is before us, the Lord's Supper, nourished for your kingdom work. God, we pray for those, uh, as we're told to do, those who rule over us, God, for our rulers, for kings, Lord, for our president, our vice president, our senate, our congresspeople. God, would you so move and work that they would rule out of your heart, Lord, that justice would stream down, that Righteousness would be seen through the legislation. And Lord, for us as a nation, that we would stay unified as your church, as your people, and that would be a witness and a testimony of the power of Christ in the lives of his, belief, of his own. And so, God, as we gather around your word, we do pray, God, 
that you would so speak to us through it. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, uh, we will be in Mark 4 one more time. And I do apologize because I told you last week that was our last time in Mark 4. Well, made a quick executive decision. Um, Mark 4, and we'll be dealing with one more parable. Well, parable dealing with the seed again. Uh, getting started, it would be good to have a fresh reminder this morning of just who the greatest athlete of all time is and was. None other than Michael Jeffrey Jordan, greatest athlete I think to ever live. There's one particular night, Sir Jordan, he broke a record and scored 68, or 68 points. His team would go on to face uh, someone else in the championship, and there was much celebration in the locker room that one day. Champagne popped. Everyone was excited. The confetti fell in the locker room. But a reporter found a rookie there. It was his first game playing. And he got fouled when there was like a second left. It didn't really matter. He, he shot two foul shots and made one. He finished the game with one point. And a reporter asked that rookie, because they couldn't get to Michael Jordan, couldn't get to any of their stars, said, what does this feel like? He said, I'll tell you what it feels like. It feels fantastic. Did you see what happened out there? Jordan and I scored 69 points. Now we laugh at that, but how crazy it had been if he had been serious. If he looked around, the confetti and all the things, and went, yeah, you see this? You smell the champagne? You see these cameras? They're here for me. We, he would have been laughed out of Chicago. But that's what we do. We are sometimes prone to think that we're the point. That we are the center of all things. And that's why this particular parable needs some more attention here this morning. What God is doing in the world, we play a part in. But it's not about us. It's not about our strength. And we get into trouble when we think it is. A story from the Old Testament points this out pretty easily. Uh, you probably know it. There's Israel just passing the Jordan River. And they're about to go into the promised land. And God tells them, hey, it's your land. Take it. Well, they send a, a few spies out. And you know the story. Ten of them came back and said, we can't do it. There's giants in there. Two of them were actually faithful and said, well, God is with us. We can do it. And you know what happened? God judged that generation. The entire generation died except those two. And by the time they actually got there, the new generation... They get there and they meet this lady named Rahab and she goes, Hey, man, we heard about your God and what he did in Egypt. This whole generation has been scared of y'all. Like that whole time, God had gone before them. They had been in fear of the Lord, but yet they didn't walk in it. That whole generation. And, and that's the thing. It's not about you, your strength. It's about a mighty, strong, incredible God and what he plans to do. That was the lesson. So we come to Mark 4, and it's a parable I like what we talked about two weeks ago. Jesus is speaking to his people, and he says this, verse 26 of chapter 4. He was saying, the kingdom of God is like a man who cast seed upon the soil. And he goes to bed at night, he gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows. How he himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, then the mature grain in the head. But when the crop permits, he immediately puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. And he said, how shall we picture the kingdom of God? Or by what parable shall we present it? It is like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the soil, though it is smaller than all the seeds there upon the soil, yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and forms large branches, so that the birds of the air can nest under its shade. With many such parables, he was speaking the word to them, as far as, he was able, as they were able to hear it. And he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. This morning we're going to talk about three things, about the kingdom of God, and why you, as a child of God, should not have an ounce of fear right now. 
You should not have an ounce of fear. There's plenty of stuff to fear if you want to go there. But big picture, this whole section of Scripture is this. The God who expands His kingdom, comparable to how a mustard seed works, knows exactly what He's doing, and you should actually be encouraged. Three things, the wonder, the way, and the wood. First, let's go back to 26, the wonder. He was saying the kingdom of God is like a man who casts seed upon the soil. He goes to bed at night and gets up by day, and the seed sprouts and grows how he himself does not know. The soil produces crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and then the mature grain in the head. And here's the beautiful thing. The charge of putting down the seed is given to us. The responsibility of its growth is given to God. And this is why Jesus uses the imagery of a farmer in agriculture. I don't see a dare out here, but if a dare was here, I would ask him this. Is there anything we can do to make that thing grow after we planted it, watered it, it's in the soil? Is there any kind of muslin we can do? Is there any kind of like, come on, come on plant, grow? There's not. What proactive steps can we honestly take to make sure the plants grow after we've planted them? There's not much you can do. You can mess up, but there's not much you can do. After the soil has been set, the, you just sit and wait patiently and watch. Uh, Jesus mentions a man going to bed and waking up, just so we know. Just, just so we know. He was inactive asleep while it grew. And what does this mean for us? This is not a call to passivity in the Christian life. It's a call to faithfulness. Uh, I have met many uh, a, a Christian parent who thought they were doing very good. They were faithful in putting out the seed, faithless of proactively trying to be God in their life, faithless in trying to do the work of the Holy Spirit after the seed's in there, doubling down, trying to play the role of God. But what do we have a picture here? A faithful sower who waits on God to do what only God can do. Uh, I have no control over the spiritual growth of my loved ones. I can encourage, I can plant, but other than that, the seed's down. The growth is up to His grace. So take heart. If you are out there praying for your children, if you're praying for an uncle, a, a father, anyone, a loved one who does not yet know the Lord, take heart. He moves it in His own timing. Uh, take heart. But it's not just personal. God was going to do something with these 11 disciples. And it was going to be done in such a way that human strength couldn't explain it. At the time of his teaching here, Rome was the tree. Rome was the world power. And here, these 11 people, with their Savior, their rabbi, just, just died, would overturn the world's order. Just those 11. And that's how God moves. That's the wonder. The kingdom of God moves and enlarges in such a way that only explanation is supernatural. That's how farming works. So what observation can we make? We are a people who are to have confidence despite appearances. We are to be a people who are patiently waiting on God to move, either in our loved ones or globally. Uh, we don't bring in the kingdom, but we are servants of the kingdom. We're not the cause of the kingdom. So the patience of the farmer is supposed to remind us here of how we too are to wait on him to move. All we can do is pray and plant and wait. And if you think about it in history, the church has always, always limped through history, yet that limp is confirmation of his power. The church is perpetually defeated, yet survives her conquerors. Perpetually defeated, yet always survives her conquerors. It's a, it's a wonderful way of explaining the kingdom of God. Now, let's look at the way. The way the kingdom expands. The word picture here is a tiny seed. It's supposed to bring to your mind potency. It's supposed to bring to your mind power. Uh, Never-ending expansion of the kingdom going to all facets of society. And here's the mathematics. Death and resurrection. That's the math of the kingdom. What does the seed do? It dies. And then it grows and grows grows. Uh, these happened with all the disciples Jesus was talking to. The message went around the known world. 
There is something about that kingdom. Fight the temptation to give into a pessimistic way to look at the headlines right now. There's a way to faithlessly look at the headlines and say, oh, that's it. We are morally lax. Everything's going to you know where. It's this awful time. Oh, it's horrible. Fight the temptation because either this parable is real or it's not. The kingdom of God is like a tiny little seed that grows and grows and expands and gets bigger. And there's a way to look at these times, as one theologian said. He was talking about the end times, and he goes, Why polish the brass on a sinking ship? No, that's faithless. That's a pessimistic way to look at this, our, our times. See, here's the deal Reformations are messy, revivals are messy. And I love this quote. Uh, the kingdom of God is a series of victory after victory, cleverly disguised as disaster. God's camo is disaster. He hides his conquest through the camo of disaster. He overthrows kingdoms. We've been praying for revival. This is exactly what it looks like. <laughs> Do you know what it looks like? Revivals happen because something's wrong. <laughs> uh, so typical of God's movement in history there's usually a downturn in, in morality uh, in the public arena. It looks like a ruling official who can no longer meet here for worship. It looks like a pastor getting arrested for holding church. But those are preludes to revival. you got to go with the seed imagery. The seed has to die to produce fruit. And what looks like the worst thing in the world is actually God moving and expanding His kingdom. Remember, the image of Jesus giving us here is of a kingdom continually expanding, continually growing. If you're here for movie night, you'll probably remember this. There's a story of a Russian Bible teacher who was uh, locked up for 17 years in the gulag. All he did was just preach the Bible. That's all. He was not a preacher. He just taught the local kids. Well, they busted in there, took him away, and there he is in the gulag. It's a true story. They tried everything they could to get him to just sign this sheet of paper saying that I will no longer be a Christian. What you say is true. Uh, all hail the state. Uh, so they would drag someone who looked like his wife in front of him and he could hear her being tortured. They tried all kinds of things. He would wake up every, every morning, hands outstretched, and sing his heart song, just a, a song of praise. A thousand people in that gulag, they would all throw things and yell and boo at him when he did that. Uh, they made life really bad. Well, after 17 years, they finally decided it was time. It was time to go ahead and do the inevitable. They took him out to the firing round. They were going to take him out. And as he's being moved out, what do you hear? You hear a thousand prisoners, hands outstretched, singing that heart song. The whole gulag had been converted. And that is God's playbook. That's the seed kingdom. It dies and in its death produces large extravagant things we never dreamed of for the kingdom of God. You can't have resurrection without death. And many in our camp are scared. Many in our camp are reading the headlines saying, Oh, that's it! We are done for! I would argue, no, we're just beginning. We're just beginning. Because if you look with biblical lenses through history, you'll see the same pattern. God is on the move, expanding His kingdom. Hear me out. I'm, I'm not trying to, like preachers, we, we do this sometimes. I'm not trying to make you feel bad. I'm not trying to make me feel bad. We're all in this together. However, I'll just say this. The more we're about our comfort, the more we're about that, that seed is not going to do its growing. Uh, we, we need to have a death of our own. We need to die to human applause, to always being accepted, to always being uh, having the world embrace the church. That's, that's just never promised in Scripture. and that we're, we're coming to a point where that will not be the reality. So there's things we're going to be called to die to. Uh, but remember, the seed dies and produces life. Our prayer should be, oh God, fashion us into those ready to put to death what needs to be put to death in order for your kingdom to grow. Uh, my fear is that many are scared, thinking end times and things are getting awful. No man knows the hour of the day. We don't know. Uh, but, but like the theologian, he said, why polish the brass on a sinking ship? You know, the children of Israel would have been like, amen. The group that was there not going to the promised land would have been like, hallelujah, I hear you. We're not called to that. We're not called to that. Here's the, here's the real promise of this parable. 
we should leave here extremely encouraged. Watch the headlines, what's going on with a little miner's hat. We have, we have a view that goes about this far, and what we see looks really, really bad, but we don't see everything else around. We don't see, as Matthew would put it in his own part of this parable, he adds one more part and says the kingdom of God is like leaven that goes through a loaf, that it continues to expand and go out. We don't see the leavening, but it is happening, brothers and sisters. I'll close, or, or, well, one more thing needs to be mentioned before we go to the next part. Did you know the Tenement Square thing, just for example, Tenement Square happened in 1989, I believe. Uh, you would have thought the media portrayed it as uh, a bunch of kids just started reading Thomas Jefferson got really fired up about liberty. Uh, yeah, kind of, but did you know that there was a fountain there that weekend where 7,000 people were baptized? 7,000 were baptized? You didn't hear much about that. Did you know that uh, Africa is becoming more and more Christian? Did you know that China went from 10,000 to 10 million believers in the, in the span of about 25 years? So the kingdom is growing. It is expanding. It's, it's like you read these parables and go, wow, it's actually happening. <laughs> What Jesus talked about is true. <laughs> and, and remember, the nations were promised to Jesus. The nations were promised to Jesus. And that kingdom of God is like a little mustard seed, grows, expands, becomes the largest of trees. God the Father disciplines us momentarily, for sure. Uh, temporarily, temporarily judges us. Uh, and that's normally what we see. But he is certainly not done. The seed continues to grow into this great tree. Last thing before we have the supper, look at uh, one more thing to think about is the wood. The wood. So where is the gospel in this passage, you might be asking? Notice the reaper coming in. And we always hear that and think the reaper is like this bad imagery. It's not. He's collecting a group to himself. That's what he's talking about. The, the, the to himself. But how? He's, he's speaking of a seed which becomes a tree. And you reverse that and you have the life of Christ. God Almighty left eternal fellowship. The Son left fellowship with the Father and the Spirit. And He became a man. Step back, He became a baby. Step back, He became a single cell. All this is startling. I've heard the best comparison you can have of this is imagine you becoming an ant. A little tiny ant. That's the best we can come up with. It was a downgrade, for sure, a downgrade. But why? So that his human flesh could be broken. So that his blood could be shed for us, for you and I. So that the, the wrath of God, as it were, in, in ray form, if you want to think of it like that, he steps in front of it and absorbs it because of his great love for us. We are accepted. We are justified because of his great love for us. And it's interesting, he uses the word of, of a tree, a tree that grows. If you think about biblical history, we all fell at a tree. We all were redeemed at a tree. We fell at a tree, we were redeemed at a tree. And it's at that tree, the second tree, where the curse fell on Jesus the Son. Jesus, the perfect Son of God, received what was due for us. So this supper we're about to partake in. Uh, Remember that, this tangible expression of his body broken, his blood shed, so that we could be accepted by the Father. And so to the degree that that's a big deal, you will walk in freedom. It motivates you, human approval loses its power. Suddenly all the other sins we're prone to go towards are no longer that shiny because of what's happened for us at the cross, because of Jesus Christ. So why would he save you? And why would he say things like this in Mark 4 and leave you? Hanging? Trust him. Trust him when it seems like the waves are crashing. Trust him every time you read that paper and go, we are just going crazy. Trust him. For the kingdom is actually progressing. Remember, it's about him. And he is up to something. And surely, surely, surely it's not our strength. We don't rely on our strength for saving our loved ones. It's not in our power. Uh, it's in His. And may we always remember the story of that rookie. Today, I made 69 points with Michael Jordan. That's you and I. <laughs> Let us pray. Father, we thank You, God, for Your beautiful creation that we have just experienced. We thank You, Lord, for the supper that is before us. 
We thank you, Lord, for all your many blessings. Uh, we thank you for these tangible, tangible elements before us that point to, to the body broken, the blood shed. Lord, may this energize us for the work ahead of expanding your kingdom. May we not forget that you are up to something, that you are expanding your kingdom even when it looks like it, you're not. Uh, Lord, enable us, strengthen us for the times ahead, for relying on you and your grace, and, and for knowing and trusting you with our loved ones. I know many of us are praying continually for a brother here, uh, a sister there, um, a child. Lord, may we not forget to constantly bring before them, uh, bring before your throne them and ask that you do a work in their hearts. Bless us for the remainder of this service, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Our song before having the supper will be the first two well, actually, no, just one, just one verse of spirit song. Those able, let's please stand. Is that good? Yes. Okay.